Welcome to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness, a podcast where I talk about the Constitution, history, politics, and pretty much anything else I want to talk about. Now, you can find me on AnnetteTalks.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and especially YouTube. If you want to see what we look like, go to YouTube.com forward slash Annette Talks, and you can find me on Facebook at Annette Talks. So Annette's talking all over the place. Or as my daughters, when I played, I, I went on Roblox with them and they gave me a username of Annette Talks Too Much. So <laughs> apparently I'm known for talking. And today we are going to be talking about a really great book that I picked up at the library. It's The Next Realignment, Why America's Parties Are Crumbling and What Happens Next by Frank J. Stefano, who is joining me today. Hi, Frank. Hi, Annette. <laughs> did I pronounce your name right? Yes, you did. All right. All right. And so, um, as we were talking about it beforehand, um, I've been, I, I walked to the library one day and I saw this book and it jumped out at me because I've been thinking about the two parties for a while. And, um, I, I, you know, I've been meditating on why are so many people becoming independents and, you know, people aren't uh, identifying as strongly with the two parties anymore. It just seems like it's not the same two parties as I can even remember as a kid, you know, and been trying to figure out why, what's going on with that. And so I picked up your book and I was gratified to find that it was pretty easy reading and very engrossing, especially if you're a history buff um, like I am, Thank you. I'm a, a political um, junkie as well. It, it appeals to both of those <laughs> sides of me. Um, and also that it was uh, kind of optimistic, uh, especially at the end, that also appealed to me and it was not partisan. I kept thinking, well, I have an idea of, of, of who Frank might be, but from the, if I just read the book, I wouldn't say he's a Republican or a Democrat. And just while I'm mentioning that, so I just wanted to give everyone a bit, an idea of who you are. Um, and you are an attorney and you're currently in DC. Are you still? I'm currently in DC, yeah. All right, and you worked as a congressional aide during the contract with America on other political campaigns, including, um, helping Rudy Giuliani with his policy agenda, right? That's correct. So you have some experience with this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. For a, for a long time, you know, I've been sort of a political hand as well as a lawyer and, and tilled some in the field of politics and All Republican right. politics. Yeah, we tend to be, we tend to be drawn, drawn towards that. I don't know. It must be something about the lawyer brain that, that wants to be in control. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> anyway, the book was a lot of fun, and so I thought what we would do is go through sort of a brief history of the um, past realignments, because the book says we're due overdue for a major realignment. And so I wanted to go through quickly what the past realignments were um, and where we're headed from the L, and then we're going to talk about the awakenings that you mentioned in your book. So how many um, realignments have there been so far? So we are currently living in what they call the fifth party system. So we've had five sets of political parties. And by parties, I don't necessarily always mean the names, right? Because we've had Democrats going all the way back to, to Andrew Jackson. We've had Republicans going back to Lincoln. So by parties, um, it's not the institutional names, but what they stand for, what they believe, what coalitions of people that they attract. So the way parties work in America, I think a lot of people think that political parties change gradually over time, which isn't really true. What they actually do, it's, it's a cycle of destruction and rebirth that repeats over and over, where, you know, we have a moment of crisis, some big issue that's hitting the country, um, and we form into two big coalitions, each with about half the country, and, and we form into two parties, and they have unique ideologies, unique coalitions of people, uh, unique agendas, and then they start fighting about that problem, and then they exist like that over decades and decades at a time. Um, and, you know, the issues change, and, you know, they change even some demographically in ways, but ideologically they stay the same. And so, like, in our era, we've had conservatism and liberalism, and, and since we've had our parties, we've had the Republican Party, which has represented ideologically conservatism, and uh, the Democrats have represented New Deal liberalism, and that's going back to 1932. And then after we do this, they decay over time, and eventually they collapse. Usually in the time of a new crisis, something, you know, they, over time, after the problems get resolved, the parties get weak, 
people start infighting, they don't really stand for anything, the system starts to drift, and those weak parties will kind of, you know, drift that way for a time until another crisis hits them. They collapse, and then in the rubble of the collapse, we create two new parties and two new ide ideologies to look at politics a new way. And that's a party system, and that's what usually scholars call a party system. So um, we've had, I said, five party systems, and then four realignments between them. And so there's the first party system that everybody knows between Hamilton and Jefferson, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. And that was a, a, a fight that was basically about what to do with, uh, you know, we, we created this new republic on paper and nobody really knew how it was supposed to work in practice. The founders had a lot of different ideas about what it was going to mean and they divided into two camps, we, uh, one around Hamilton, one around Jefferson, uh, with different ideas about how to take this, this paper republic and turn it into a real one in practice. And so that was the big ideological debate. And then those parties collapsed um, in the War of 1812 because that debate got resolved. Basically, everybody agreed, all the founding generation basically, you know, once we had created the republic, it worked, they all knew how it worked. We implemented a lot of Hamilton's ideas, but Jefferson won the politics, the, and then those parties collapsed. And then we had two new ones. The second party system was, was over Andrew Jackson, Jacksonian democracy. So that's the, the Democrats and the Whigs. And then they were basically, what had happened was there was, you know, the country had changed a lot since the, the early republic and the founding, you know, as we'd moved west. So, you know, you'd had years of, of pioneers moving out west, the country now was no longer, you know, 13 colonies hugging the eastern seaboard. It was past the Mississippi, all these new small towns and farms, and it presented a whole new set of problems, and particularly about how to take what had been a, uh, you know, the founders Republican, Republic had been very elite driven, right? Their idea had always been the people would elect uh, their, you know, these elite people to rule for them, that the people would be represented, but it was, so, but now we, you know, people, as the country had grown, people wanted to participate in politics, and you've got the populist ideas of Andrew Jackson, and then the Whigs, which were more of a meritocratic reforming set of ideas, and the country to be divided. So that's the second part. And they're fighting about the frontier issues of frontier America. And then uh, the, I wanted the third, to tell you really quickly yeah. that I finally think I have a handle on populism after reading your book. <laughs> it's, it's I, like, I appreciate you hear, that. That's, you hear that thrown around a lot. Um, but it's I fundamentally misunderstood, right? A lot of times, and and this idea of of the people versus the elite, right? But but you know, because right, populism is this idea about you know that there is somebody whoever is running the system are not the real representatives of the people, right? And that that they have to be replaced to be real representatives of the people. That the people are people like us, and these guys are kind of alien and. Um, and it's not just, because the difference is a lot of people think like populism is giving stuff to people. And that's usually, it usually flows out of progressivism or different ideas. Mm -hmm. Populists don't want stuff. They want power for people like them who they think they're the legitimate um, representatives of the people of the nation. They want to make sure that the people who are running the country are representatives of them. It's a very different idea. And a lot of times you see a lot of stuff where called populism that isn't populism. Oh, yeah. And it's funny because you can find that anywhere on the political spectrum, as we know it. Mm -hmm. And and you mentioned in the book that it's not, it seems an odd thing to have in this country, since we don't have an aristocracy, we don't have right. a class system, and yet it's still there. It's still a big issue here. And I that, think, that, it, I, I was thinking that what, as I was reading the book, that partly that comes out of, well, at least from the, the president's, uh, the majority of the presidents in my time are like Ivy League graduate. Uh -huh. But then you can find um, people like Reagan, who was not an Ivy League graduate. And yeah. so there are a few out there. But then it's like, I think, and then I Trump immediately comes to mind as well. And yet, it, you know, he's this big millionaire, runs all these corporations. So how, he's, how is he one of the little guys? He's not, but he talks down at that level. And yeah. I, that's he, what and people see him as a way to put political control back into the hands of people like them. Right. right? That, that's the whole idea. And, and that's, uh, and it, so it doesn't even, even matter if he's people like them, if he's going to give political control to people like them, who they say, well, 
we are being we've been disenfranchised. There's this this elite that is not, you know, of the people who are running things, and that we want political control again. Right. Um, Sorry, I so, pulled yeah. you away from your. Oh yeah, let's, I just well, had yeah, to I mean, it's a whole because, other interesting discussion. All right, so the third part, I'll try to be faster too because I'm taking a while. But yeah, the third party system is civil war, right? right? So the the Jackson parties die over the fight over slavery, and we end up we having a civil war, and we emerge with these two new parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, which are basically representing um, the issues of the war and and regional North versus South, but even more than that, um, you know the 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 Democrats represent the South as well as Northern, a lot of urban immigrants who feel locked out of, you know, the Republicans after the war, are obviously the majority party and they're kind of in, in charge. So then you get that third party system. And then that falls apart with industrialization because now we have this whole new big problem of, um, we have an economic regime that's built on agriculture and small towns and family farms. But now we have this industrializing country and factories and the cities are exploding and the political system doesn't have any way to really talk about, they don't have anything to say about this, and that's the Gilded Age, which got very kind of corrupt and people got angry and you had a populist uh, revolt that led to the Democrats. Um, there was a populist third party, the People's Party, and William Jennings Bryan, who was a 36-year-old kid, which I, I love the Bryan story because it's fascinating to me how a guy who, he had two terms in the House, he's out of office, he ran for the Senate and he lost. He's 36 years old. So he's a former two-term congressman. He walks in the Democratic National Convention and he just taps into these new neglected issues and people are so angry. He walks out the nominee for the Democratic Party and then throws out all of its agenda and its elites and its ideas and basically merges it, does it executes a third party takeover of the Democratic Party, creates a whole new Democratic Party. Um, which then I found that new... fascinating as well. By the way, I didn't know all yeah. of that about William Jennings Bryan until I read it. And I was yeah. like, wow, this is, that is really- I can't funny. believe there's not a movie about it, right? No, no. Right, like that's like, you'd think that, you know, this, this 36 year old kid who walks into the Democratic convention, walks out potentially the president. And then it's one of the most fascinating political races too, mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, basically invents campaign finance reform, or not reform of campaign finance because the Republican Party under McKinley starts raising all kinds of money, which had never happened before. Brian starts barnstorming the country, doing populist politics, which had never happened before. It's just an amazing story. And it changed the, you know, it, it changed the parties and it changed the country and created, you know, the Republicans in response now have to come up with their own agenda about industrialization. This is how you get Teddy Roosevelt. So the Republicans become the progressive party of Teddy Roosevelt. The Democrats are populist William Jennings Bryan. And, and then we get this reformist, populist, and progressive era, which then leads us into the New Deal, because, you know, we, we do all these reforms. America emerges from the First World War. It's this powerful, now great power. And then we get the Roaring Twenties, and we're fat and happy, and politics gets drifting and corrupt again. Nothing's getting done. Uh, and, and then you get the economy implodes in the Great Depression, and everything falls apart again. And then FDR walks in and starts just throwing everything at the wall to create a new agenda to deal with the, the, the crisis and unwittingly creates this all new ideological idea, New Deal liberalism and creating the New Deal. And that's the thing is that people don't realize that what we call liberalism as an idea didn't exist before 1932. And then in response to that, the people who didn't like what FDR was doing for different reasons, right? Some of it, they had objections about uh, that it was trampling on American liberty. And so you have the liberty people, and then they get thrown together with people who are concerned that um, it's trampling on traditional American values, essentially, that it's changing the nature of, that what FDR was doing was changing the nature of America and the things that had led to American success, these ideas of virtue, and it creates a new movement, conservatism, which then takes over the Republican Party. So that idea that we now consider conservatism did not exist before 1932. And it yeah. launches this liberal and conservative debate that now has framed our entire lives, but came out of sort of backwards result of this fight over Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal and the depression through the First World War. And then, then that's what we've been doing ever since. So the, the problem then you immediately see when you see it that way is, well, we haven't updated our politics since the Great Depression. And we don't live in that world anymore. We don't even have an industrial economy anymore, right? The, the, the fight about 
they, like if you look at what the New Deal fight was about, they fought a lot over the size and role of government. And that makes sense because they were fighting about how to manage an industrial economy, right? You have this industrial economy that had just melted down and you're like, what do we do as, as modernity had happened, which modernity is this, you know, you cars and factories and airplanes. And, and then you have everything going on in Europe at the time with the Nazism and communism and these new ideas about we need a lot more centralization to run a modern country. And so these questions they're fighting about is, well, what is the role for the government in running the economy? Okay. But it was how to run an industrial economy of factories. And, you know, it wasn't a post-industrial information economy. You know, the, the questions of what to do, or, or even a, an issue like, what do we do about the rise of China? And, you know, the answer to it isn't really found in, well, fight big government or, you know, more New Deal. It's like something else. Mm -hmm. And we haven't updated this, this fight. We've been having the same fight about FDR since 1932, but the world has changed substantially, which then gets into this whole idea of, of these cycles of realignments. Because when we have this disconnect between our problems and our political framework, you know, traditionally, what do you see? Well, first you see corruption and drift, nothing's getting done, a lot of partisan fighting over symbolism and identity, um, and nothing is happening because, you know, all the real problems that the fight is about have been solved, so there's really nothing left to do, but nobody yet has glommed on how to deal with the new problems. Nobody really knows what to do about the new problems yet, and to solve them in a new way would mean dividing your coalition, or um, uh, somehow doing something unfamiliar, which is alienating, and so nobody wants to rock the boat. And so things just sort of drift, and then when things, nothing's happening, that's when the corruption, corruption sets in because people aren't focused on really governing, so all they're just focused on is, is their own careers and personal interest. And then it goes like that for a while until you get hit with another big crisis that makes everybody wake up and say, wait a minute, um, you know, we have problems that have to get solved. We need to figure out what to do. And when that happens, then very quickly the parties and the whole framework collapses and we create new parties and new ideologies built around the new era of problems. And we've done this consistently. It's just none of us know it because we've lived our whole lives in the stable part of the New Deal era. And that's, you know, that's politics to us. And that's what's happened before. I mean, if you look even like, how did the Civil War get out of hand? Well, a lot of it was because, you know, the compromises that, you know, slavery had emerged as a new issue because of the Mexican-American War, where uh, the country had taken all this new land in Mexico, and it was going to admit, you know, up to 10 or 12 new states. And each one, they had to decide whether it was going to be slavery or, or, or free. And that was going to change the balance in the Senate, which was going to change. So all of a sudden, that's the top of the agenda. And, and instead of dealing with that issue, they tried to push through a bunch of compromises because they thought politics meant the Jacksonian politics of 1920 or 1824. Mm -hmm. So they, didn't, they just tried to push the new issues off the scene to go back to what they knew. And what happened was everything blew up because the new problems were the problems that people wanted to solve. And so that's what always happens. And then, and then we create the cycle again. So we've been drifting for a long time and we're in the same party system that we started in 1932. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I would say like since really like around the end of the 90s, 2000, right, was the last time, like I, I the way I look at it is between Ronald Reagan and the contract with America and Gingrich was sort of the summing up of the New Deal fight. Like, okay, you know, the, in the early part, the Democrats had had control and they had to put through the New Deal. Then there was sort of the counter pushback through Reagan, through the contract, where, you know, the Democrats had proposed New Deal liberalism, they would implemented it, the American people saw what they did. Then you had the counter pushback that was like, okay, well, where has it gone too far? Where do we not like where this has gone? Where, where, where you know, what are the new, how do we make sure that this doesn't violate other principles that we have? And then we fought about that for 15 years. And then we basically reached a point where we, you know, we had reformed the stuff that the American people wanted to reform, but we, uh, at the same time, they weren't, they didn't want to go any farther. We're, we're not going to re, we're not going to do another great society. You know, the Democrats can campaign on it all they want, but the reality is if they tried to redo another great society, the American people would throw them out of office. But at the same time, we're not going to abolish Social Security or Medicare. They're done. Right. So there's nothing, that, you know, basically by the end of the 90s, 
there was really nothing left to fight about. And so, you know, politics has been fierce. Like ideologically, we're fighting about a lot. You know, symbolically, we're fighting about a lot. But in practice, there's very little actually been happening. So why do you think, because we really are a very divisive country right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like your book talked about some of these awakenings or reasons yeah. for that. So, be, but before I get there, because I don't want to forget, you start okay. out the book basically saying, no, we're not going to have a third party. That we're oh, a yeah. two-party country. So why is it, I mean, my libertarian friends always, you know, and I have a deal yep. now, I, I seem to, I, I, I'm drifting that way a little bit. But you see that that party never goes anywhere. And I don't know if it's because they don't want to follow the rules because they're libertarian and they don't like to organize. I don't know what it is. But why do you think we're two party and and that we'll always be two party? Yeah. So right. And and, and and before I start, there's a distinction too, because you know, that between third party and new party, right? right. So we're never gonna have three or more parties existing at the same time for more than like an election or two, right? It will always trend back to two and only two major parties, each winning about half the vote. Why do you think and, that is? Okay, and so the reason for this is, and you can just even, when you reason through it, it makes sense. You look at the structure of how the Republic set up, okay? Um, to get anything done, you need majority. You need a majority. You need 50% plus a little bit. And that's true in our first past the post voting, which a lot of people focus on. But it's even bigger than that because um, it's not just that to get elected, you need 50%. Then in Congress, to get anything passed, you need 50% of Congress. And, and if you want to, you know, do anything that's going to stick, also you need the courts, okay? Then you also need, you know, it's a federal system. So you don't need just 50% one place. You need it everywhere because mm -hmm. you got to get through all the state houses and you've got state governorships and, and state legislators. So to actually implement an agenda consistently, you need 50% of the people plus one in a coalition to get anything done. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the thing that everybody misses, and political scientists miss this a lot too, you know, a lot of political scientists like to focus on the first part where they'll talk about, well, it's, you know, you need 50%. You also don't want to get too much more than 50% because everybody you add to your coalition is wasting political power on people you don't need. So if I was a party and I'm winning 60% consistently, I've got 10%, well, let's say I want to really get to 52, 53 consistently. And the other 7%, the most annoying parts of my coalition, I want to throw them out because I don't need them to win. And they're asking for stuff that either violates the, the values of other people in the coalition, or it's just I'm wasting resources that I don't need on them. You know, political resources, not just even, you know, stuff, but political resources and time and effort on their issues. But also it's either creating conflicts in the party. And you always see this all the time. You guys are rhinos, you're dinos, we don't need you. If you're winning too much, then the people, the core of the party will start throwing people out uh, by doing what they can to push them out or just ignore them. So if you're under 50%, you fight to get to 50%. And if you're over 50%, you go back, you start throwing people out, throwing them into the other party. So you always end up with two and only two major parties. They each always get about 50%, half each, and no more, you know, and, and they have to do that on a national basis. You know, they'll have areas where they do better, areas where they do worse, but over, it's, it's a federal system, you have to, na you need a national party that nationally can control about half the country, which is what you've always seen. So you can't really have a third party because if you had a third party, um, what would happen would be you'd have three parties, nobody had a majority. So two of them would make an alliance because they could win all the time. If, if right now we got three parties, they all get nothing. But if two of them make an alliance, then two of them can get you know, at least some of what they want and leaving the other one out in the cold. So they'll unite and then throw out the people they don't need getting back to two. Mm -hmm. So you never, if you had three parties within an election or two, it will trend back through natural forces back to two. And that's what's always consistently happened. Excellent. But, yeah. But the thing that, that, okay, that I don't mean is it doesn't mean you can't have a third party show up and replace one of the major parties. Right. And that happens right. all the time. So, you know, if, if libertarians want to be a third party, they need to find a way to get to 50% of the vote and knock off one of the major ones. And, and that's what people sometimes miss when they say, so like in a stable era, right, there's no way for a third party to show up because 
the parties are satisfying everybody sufficiently. So if you come up with a third party, there's no way you're going to get to 50% because you got two parties that are organized, they're winning half the vote, they're implementing agendas, and their agendas are what people mostly care about. You can't get half the country dissatisfied enough to leave them. But in a transitional era, like the one we're in now during these realigning eras, where people are unhappy, things aren't getting done, then you can build a new party coalition and, you know, and knock off like the Whigs or the Federalists, um, or even we were talking about Brian, what Brian did, where he based, you know, the, people often say that the Democrats co-opted the People's Party, the Populist Party. But, you know, I always see it very differently. I, as far as I can tell, the Populist Party took over the Democratic Party and kept the name because it had a better brand name, the same way you see in corporate mergers all the time, where AT&T used to be, I forget who took it, SBC or whatever, right? SBC bought AT&T and renamed themselves AT&T because it was a better name. It was a more popular name. So anyway, so that, so if, you, if you're a third party person, it doesn't mean you can't create a new party and you just need to get to 50% and knock off the Republicans or the Democrats, which yeah. could be done. Interesting. All right, so before we go back there, because we're going to go back to what we think is going to happen next, um, with all the divisiveness that I've seen, I can never decide if it's divisiveness or divisiveness. But um, if, well, I want to know why we're so divisive if we're not really arguing about policy right now. Mm -hmm. And so your book talks about these awakenings. So can you tell me what an awakening is and why we're, or what kind of awakening we're in right now and how it came about? Yeah, all right. So it is a separate cycle in America from realignments, right? Uh, it runs independently. So it, you don't need to have a, an awakening to have a realignment. You can be anywhere on, in, in, in each cycle and have it work. But what awakenings are is the country, it's, it's like a pendulum going back and forth between uh, pragmatic eras and moralistic eras. And awakenings are the moralistic era. And uh, the reason for it the best ex explanation for the reason for it, it's just a matter of, did you grow up in good times or bad times? When the country goes through bad times, people grow up and they tend to be very pragmatic, they make compromises, and they want to build. When people grow up in good times, when things are peace and prosperity, then they start looking at everything that exists that's wrong, that they don't like, that they think is unjust, and you get these eras of moral fervor and reform about tearing down the things that don't work, that, that they don't like, and, uh, and, and trying to undo things that are unjust. And you see this consistently throughout history as we go back and forth as a country where, you know, we have a something, you know, war, a huge crisis, people get very pragmatic for decades, and then we transition back to these moralistic eras. And the moralistic eras are eras of, of moral reform. And, you know, the biggest thing is these religious revivals probably the most significant part throughout history has been they always lead to massive religious revival. And that's the name Great Awakenings. The first Great Awakening was the religious revival that helped um, push the country into the, uh, the American Revolution. Well, it, it, it's historically debated a lot uh, on, on the role between them, but basically before the American Revolution, there was a huge religious revival um, where people got, they were challenging the establishment of the church and you had these itinerant preachers all going over America and people were kind of got very much into ideas of reform and social and moral reform. Oh, by the way, I had no, I had no clue about that whole thing until I read your book. Oh, that, really? that was some fascinating stories about those preachers. I had, yeah. If, if for no other reason it was worth reading the book just to learn about that part of our revolution before the revolutionary war, when that all was all going on, I thought I, I had no clue that there were these like superstar preachers what were George George Whitfield, who is yeah, like who became you know, I mean he really was a rock star. He he in particular, um, but you know, and then all the people who followed him and, and did the same thing he did. Yeah, they were, you know, they would they were itinerant preachers and they would come and they would preach in the in the uh, in the fields and you know hundreds there were tens of thousands of people would come out to to listen to them. The newspapers would report where they were coming and it was you know the, the country was sort of in this big religious fervor. But more than that, see, the, the, the point that I always make with this, too, is that I, I don't like that a lot of this awakening history gets shoehorned as merely religious history, because it's really 
social and moral history, because at parallel with these, you always see even secular reformist stuff happening at the same time. The whole country wants to reform. And so a lot of it has been historically expressed through religious faith, but it's not only religious faith. You also see, you know, uh, a lot of charitable efforts or efforts to change the laws and to make the laws more fair and all this. But yeah, this the, the first Great Awakening, it, the reason it's historically contentious is because obviously a lot of the founders were, you know, they were Enlightenment liberals. They, they you know, some of, the, some of them were very religious, some of them weren't, but they were caught up in the same moral fervor and, and this whole idea of challenging the role of the church, the establishment church, um, it was one step further from challenging the bishop to challenging the king. And it was kind of a big stepping stone for a lot of people where they were trying to, to uh, you know, fight the establishment churches and, the, and the, throw out the bishops and, the, and create the, it, what was basically the first evangelical movement in, in America. And in doing that, it, uh, it, it then it, it caused people next to be like, well, if I don't have to listen to the bishop, why, why do I got to listen to the king? And it, it spurred us to, to revolution as well as just the, the general moral fervor in society. People wanted to fix things. They wanted to reform things. They didn't want to accept things they thought were broken. And that spirit had washed over the country. But then again, after the revolution, that all dried up because uh, people got very pragmatic again because they'd just been through a war and a lot of people had died and it was very disruptive. And so then, you know, the early Republic was a period of building again. It was very, it was the, 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 the religious revival ended, uh, the reformism ended, people got very much into compromise and pragmatism and building the structures of the, of the Republic. And then there was another awakening in started around the 1820s and really got going by the, the 30s and 40s, which was the second great awakening, which was another huge, it was probably even a bigger, I guess you'd say, which is the bigger religious revival, but the second great awakening, which um, created all these social reform movements, uh, which the most important, which was abolition. And it, as well as, as women's suffrage, uh, uh, temperance, all these, uh, and that's what I always find fascinating too, the people that don't, I mean, people who know, but the, the intertwining between abolition and uh, the, the religious revival and women's suffrage, which now people think is like somehow different issues and opposed, and it's all the same movement, right? You know, yeah. and that, which, which a lot of it, which drove the civil war, where the country then got, we, people didn't want to compromise. They didn't want to deal with things they thought were unjust. And then you saw the secular side of it too, with transcendentalism and all this came out of the same era. And then the third great awakening was the one that created the progressive movement, which was, again, a lot of people don't realize the, the, how religiously driven a lot of the progressive movement was. That's a whole nother thing. There was another big religious revival after the civil war. So the civil war, we get pragmatic again, right? We have the civil war, the, the moral fervor drives us into the civil war, and then we fight this war and then it's horrible and people then get pragmatic for a while because they want to build and they, they want to recover. But then when we start hitting to the end of the 1800s, now you have another big moral revival, which leads to the third great awakening, which is the one that uh, led to this idea of the social gospel, which was that it was your duty as a Christian to do social reform, which is you saw these people going out into the cities to try to do charitable work, uh, with the tenement houses, things like Hull House and Jane Addams, as well as to change the laws. And the country got very, this moral fervor again. And then that dried up um, after the First World War, because again, big trauma and people get pragmatic again. And that's how politics was that through the Second World War. And then in the 60s, we got moralistic again, because baby boomers, things are going good. Uh, we have a new generation that doesn't, you know, not the post-war generation that wants to uh, compromise and build, but they're looking and seeing things that they think are unjust. And it, it has two, what's fascinating about this awakening era, which is, so the first three are very sort of textbook great awakenings. A lot of people use the term fourth great awakening for the 60s, but sometimes it's contentious because there was the evangelical revival of that time, which kind of really kicked in about the, the 70s. Like it, it the, the, the late 60s, you started seeing the really young people, though, through the counterculture, which was a moralistic reform movement, which we don't consider as religious, but had all the hallmarks of this. But then the other side of it, which was as they got a little older, you started seeing 
also channeled through religion through the evangelical movement, which then became the, the religious right. And the country has ever since been in a moral fervor where we've stopped worrying about compromising and building and economic and pragmatic things. And we started fighting about moral and social issues about right and wrong. And in these eras, uh, things always get very divisive. And in this in particular, what's very sort of unique about our era is usually these, re these, these reformist eras have a, they're, they're sort of one big movement. And here, because of the split between secular and religious, it kind of split into two movements. So because of that, now you have two moral reform movements with each thinking the other side's idea of morality and reform is an anti-reform and they went to war with each other. Mm -hmm. And it is just ripping everything apart in politics. And it has been a really, it's, it's made, I mean, it's very similar in some ways to the Civil War movement, which kind of went a little bit of a, it, slavery kind of played a little bit of a similar thing, role, but not me, I don't think, it didn't divide, I mean, there were still moral arguments made on the pro-slavery side, but this is much more. And I think a lot of the divisiveness and what we call partisanship isn't really partisanship, it's this moral reform movements clashing into each other each seeing each other as evil because each sees the other side, what they see as a social and moral reform as an anti-reform. And they're both sort of drunk on moral fervor and they've gone to war on a, uh, uh, and there's no way to compromise. So there's no way in politics when that's going on, we're not pragmatic. We're not, we don't want to compromise because we're fighting about the people's minds, not about what works best, but what's right and what's wrong. And you can't compromise over right and wrong. It's good and evil. So it, it makes politics always very, very hard. So that's, yeah. So it seems to me as I'm listening to this and I'm, I, I pick up this book right as the, uh, the shutdown started, right? And mm -hmm. obviously the book was written before that. Yep. Um, but because, you know, the libraries are shut down, I've got to keep the book for quite some time. Which is great. Hey. I just need to buy it because it's got so much great history in it and that I'd like to reference it. Like I didn't know Stitchin a switch in time saved nine. I used to think it was a stitch in time. And so, I mean, I knew about the court packing idea from FDR, but I didn't uh -huh. know that that was the switch, in, the switch in time. Well, I think stitch in time existed. I think the switch in time was a play on words of the ah, stitch in time. Okay, well, so that, that was, yeah. Better. That makes me feel yeah. better because- Though, though the one that, that I didn't even know until I went is, I didn't know that brain trust came out of FDR's brain trust. Yeah. You know, you, people talk about a brain trust and then you realize the politics trusts were the big political issue with FD, with Teddy Roosevelt, right? Right. So with Franklin Roosevelt, he had a brain trust. And you're like, oh, just you know, like Standard Oil was a trust, but his is a brain trust. And now people throw that word around. They have no idea where it came from. Yeah, that's the fun thing about words and, and phrases when you yeah. find out where they came from. So well, I'm glad to know that it wasn't just me thinking a stitch in no, time. No, yeah, the, I think the stitch in time, if, I, if I'm right about this, I think this expression existed, but the switch in time was a play on words on it. The switch in time that saved nine, yeah. which was the, the court packing or the, the change of votes that ended the court, court packing. And it's a fascinating time period. But anyway, so, you know, we were talking before we started recording about how things have been so divided. I'm going to say divided now. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think it's fair. <laughs> yeah, I keep thinking divisive and divisive. Those two make me crazy. But anyway, I think, I think it's just potato, potato. It's like, yeah, I think it both is. Um, all right. So, They've been that way for a long time, but then, and it was mostly the big government, you know, small government argument. Right. Um, but then this thing happens and we're all like shut in, right? We're all, and so the, the, first everyone's freaking out. So there's like, mm -hmm. it's a major event. So there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, that going on. But then you started to notice that a, half of the country seemed to feel like, yes, this is a good thing that we're all in here and we're all like, you know, it was like the moral fervor thing again. We're saving mm -hmm. lives, right? Stay home, save lives. That's a little, right. if you had Facebook, you would know that that's a little thing that they put on your pictures is like, stay home, save a life or whatever. Uh -huh. So it's become a moral issue, right? If you're a goodie, if you're a good person and you want to do the right thing, you're going to stay home, save right. lives, save lives. Whereas the other half of the country, especially after, you know, the initial few weeks are passed and the ambulances aren't going up and down the street collecting the dead. Right. Um, are, are saying, we don't want to stay home anymore. Like, we're going to lose our jobs and we're going nuts here, you know. And so you started to see back towards the division. And so you have one half saying, stay home, and the other half starting to say, open up. 
And as the weeks go by, it's gotten more and more divided that way. And, uh -huh. and everyone's lined up. And then the mask issue, you see the lining up on that. And so I, I'm thinking, you know, is the COVID-19 the, the big event that forces a realignment? That, you know, someone's going to come out and say, all right. I mean, if you look at the libertarians, they're all, of course, really up in arms about the whole, you know, mm -hmm. governors taking over. And also, right. you notice it's the, the blue governors or the blue states that are the ones that are more locked down than the red states, um, for the most part. And right. so that, of course, has also created the more, you know, uh, two camps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone's standing in their camps. And, and again, it's not just a policy thing. It's a moral thing, like you said. The stay-at-home people say they're saving lives by staying at home. The open up side is saying you're going to save people from committing suicide. You're going to, you know, feed people that are starving because they're unemployed, yada, yada. So what I'm thinking is what, what's the way forward here? Like what's going to happen at the end of this? Mm -hmm. is, is there going to be, and I want to get your opinion on what you think. Is there going to be an individual or a group or a party that's going to step in and, and, and be really, um, take a really strong stand that people are going to relate to on that and create a new party? Because in your book, you talk about we need someone or a party to come up and, and say we want to save the American dream or we want to promote the American dream, which I really love because I think everyone sees the American dream as a real thing and as something that we all aspire towards living yep. and they just have different ways of getting there. And so I'm wondering, and I, I love it too. And I don't know, I, I just started designing t-shirts to sell because I love t-shirts because they make statements that you might not uh -huh. be able to make. But also it's a way to make a little money off of this thing. Sure. But, um, and so I've, after I read the book, I started thinking that of American Dream t-shirts and how much fun that would be to start like, focusing people in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. So given all of that, like what are you thinking? Like what direction do you see or where do you think we're going with all this? All right, let me, there was a couple of questions in there, so let me kind of unpack them. So I think on the pandemic, you know, obviously I wrote this before that all happened, right? And what, what I said was, and this is just looking at the patterns of history, right? There are three things that have to happen to trigger the realignment, right? You have one, you have the decline of the old issues that the parties are built on. All right, well, we've had that, right? Okay, you have the rise of new issues that the parties aren't built or structured to address. That, that they don't have a framework that and solutions, their toolkits don't have tools to deal with these new problems. All right, we've had that. And then the third was a crisis that finally kind of exposed the decline in the institutions and the parties and then knocked the whole thing down. And when I wrote it, I was kind of not sure what the crisis would be. And I was even a little worried about that because I was like, well, I mean, if we had the crisis, what's the crisis? Has it already happened? All right, and now this all happened. I'm like, all right, that's the crisis, right? Because the point of the crisis, and so if you look, it's the Great Depression, okay? Or the Panic of 1893, or this fight over the Mexican-American War did over slavery, or uh, the constitutional crisis that killed the Federalist Party. What always happens is you have some event that comes, that exposes that the parties don't have the tools to solve our problems. That we are having this framework and this debate about old problems that don't exist, we have this whole host of new problems and the parties don't really have a way to solve them and they don't have the tools and there's no, they're not going to get there and we need to do something about it because there's something urgent that we can't kick the can down the road anymore. So we've all been feeling for a while that our politics has been stagnating and problems are getting ignored and uh, the system isn't working. People have been saying politics is broken for a decade now, right? But now the pandemic is the kind of issue that then focuses everybody's mind and says, oh, okay, the politics doesn't seem capable of dealing with these problems. Now all these fights we're having about masks and all this stuff, like a lot of it to me is people, what, what nobody knows what to do. You have two pop parties that have these toolkits of liberalism and conservatism that don't have tools on what to do, right? That the solution to the pandemic isn't create a big government agency to regulate and plan, okay? That you can't fix it that way. And, and you can't fix it by just fight big government and then the pandemic goes away. Right. So you need right. something else. You need some set of tools to be like, all right, what is a policy to deal with this problem? And it's again, it's not, you know, it's one of many, but this is whole thing we're talking about China being AI. What are we going to do about the rise of AI? 
fight big government. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? There's got to be something more than that. You got to do something, okay? And, you know, both parties have been kicking the can on all of these rising issues. What do we do about automation? You know, Andrew Yang was talking about, right? This whole idea that, you know, automation is increasingly taking jobs. And, you know, we've been talking about that for a country, as a country for years, but nobody really has any plan on what to do about it. Just like kind of hope it goes away and it's not going to go away. So we have all these problems that no one's, and the, the pandemic has been the thing to me that now we're fighting about because it's focused everybody's mind on, well, what do we do? Okay. And this fight is because none of the political answers we've seen are really good answers. It's just been kind of like, let's try to muddle through this the best we can. And people are getting mad. And you know, people on the right and the left are getting mad for different reasons, mm -hmm. but they're all mad that we're muddling through what is a huge crisis and nobody seems to have a good plan, nothing that they can sell and say, here's our plan. You know, and then we're talking about, well, are we going to open up? Okay, well, if we open up, then a lot of people are going to get sick. All right, do we close up? Well, if we close up, now people can't earn a living. Well, both of those are obviously not good answers alone. There's got to be something more than that. Well, what is it? Nobody seems to know. Okay, who's working on it? doesn't seem like anybody. Nobody's working on it. Nobody's really thinking through like, okay, what's a new set of tools that we can do this doing, you know, whether you like the new deal or don't like it, what you could see is FDR, the way it happened was he didn't have a plan when he went into it. He just was like, I got this problem. And he started throwing things at the problem to try to fix it. And what he backed into was this new ideological idea on how government should work, but nobody's doing anything like that. And that's why I think when you look at this, you're like, well, of course everything's going to fall apart. And of course everything's falling apart because the system that we've had since the 30s has been revealed and exposed as unable to solve our problems. And nobody has shown up who has given everybody confidence that we can fix them. And people are getting nervous and they're getting angry and they're looking at different people in society as like, well, you're, you know, your ideas are terrible, your ideas are terrible, but nobody's come with a new ideological answer to what do we do with this new era of history? Because at the end of the day, where we stand now is a new era of history, unlike the industrial era stuff that we've been, Cold War industrial 20th century world that we lived in until recently and that frames our thinking about everything. We have this whole new world that looks very different. The United States is in a different place. Like we, we don't have the same role that we did as the defender of democracy after the Cold War. Now we have, we have Russia and China. It's a different geostrategic situation, uh, different economic forces. Um, and so somebody has to, to take that into a new idea. And the thing that I came to see was when you listen to all the complaints on the right and the left about what's wrong with the country, what's, what's not working, you know, they have the specifics are very different. And the villains are very different. But the problem always in some way comes back to this idea that the American dream is in decline. And the American dream, which I, you know, I get moved by it as an idea, because it's this idea that in America, it's not, see, it gets sometimes dismissed as a dream about prosperity, which is just a part of it, right? The prosperity is mm -hmm. nice, but that's not the point of it. And even look back to when it was originally coined, it's, it's a dream of uh, opportunity. It's a dream of uh, limitless social mobility. It's a dream that in America, this is a country where no matter where you start, no matter who you are, no matter who you know, um, there's a level playing field for you to achieve your dreams, whatever they happen to be. And, and you get to define for yourself what it is that you want to achieve. Who do you want to be? And then you get to go out in society. And there's no guarantee of success, but there is a guarantee of a level playing field. And that um, you will be treated fairly and you will give it a fair shot to achieve whatever you want in life, however you personally define it. It's not what your parents told you you had to do or what you were born into. You can just become or do or be whatever it is that you want to be. And that's the idea of America. And that idea seems to now, people feel like it's a lie, right? You hear this on the right and the left that, you know, the game is rigged, that there's, uh, there's no real opportunity anymore, that people are stuck that there are some group in charge of making the rules who are looking out for them and their friends and people that they like and, and that people like me no longer have a level playing field. And I hear that on the left and I hear it on the right. I hear it everywhere. People feel like this promise that is this promise of the American dream, which is key, 
I think to this country's identity and to our psychology as a people, people feel like that's under assault. So if you look at what the core problem of this next era is, I think it's that, like how do we restore the promise of the American dream for everybody? And I think we need to have a debate about that as a country. And I don't think there's necessarily even just one answer to it. One of the things about that is I think there's different answers. People have different ideas about how to get there and let's have a, let's talk about that. Let's have a national debate about what we can do and what ways our institutions need to adapt and change in a new world so that everybody can feel confident that the American dream is still a reality, that this promise that's key to us is a reality in the world. So that's the, the if I had to reorder our parties, which we're gonna have to do, that's the debate we need to order them about. That's the debate as a country we need to have because whatever the answer that you agree on, that, that's the problem. And I think if we can do that, we could lead to a new era of, um, you know, this fight, this worry that America's in decline, which is one of, it's one of these things that's both scary and silly because it's scary because it could happen, right? I mean, democracy in, in our republic didn't just, we weren't just, you know, we were born with it, but it, it's not, we have to sustain it. Like, it doesn't just happen. It didn't just like, there's something in Missouri that just creates democracy. And so we sit on this patch of land and we just get it. And, or prosperity or, you know, being a, a great power, all this stuff. It's not just part of the land. It's something we made. So it could decline, but it doesn't, there's no reason for it. You know, the country, we still have a great, you know, great people, great culture, great institutions, limitless wealth, great, you know, there's no reason America should be declining other than because we make bad decisions and choose it. So, you know, we're at this turning point where we need to choose it and we need to, and I think we, I think we can, and I think we will to restore this idea of, all right, let's make sure everybody has the reality of the American dream. I hope that, that it goes that direction because your book talked about a few uh, possible coalitions that could mm -hmm. um, come to, and it sounded very dystopian. Like it felt like it would end up very dystopian. And, Cause I looked at both of your coalitions and at first I thought, eh, and I'm like, oh, I don't like either one of those. Yeah. I would not feel comfortable in either one of those. And so uh, a lot of us would be like, I can't, you know, I can't do yeah. those. And it would be, it would be bad. So, well, and that's one of the things that's hard, right? You've got fit, you know, so, in any way, you got to divide the country in half, okay? And and in some ways, you look. There's always going to be people who are unhappy with some of their partners, right? Like, in any way you combine people, you're going to get stuck in a party with some people that you. you there's no way that half of the, you don't like half of the country, right? There's going to be people stuck in your party. There's always crazy people and cranks and people with bad ideas, and they got to go somewhere. They got to fit in one part or the other. But that said, what matters, I think, for how an era turns out, is okay. But what are those parties defined around? What is it they're fighting about? Mm -hmm. And what worries me is this idea of, and this is what we're, I think you're alluding to, is this idea that, all right, conservatism was classically liberty people, people who believed in the idea of liberty, who thought the New Deal was an attack on liberty, and this virtue people, these people who thought, um, and this is by virtue, I mean, not just uh, moral virtue, but this Republican virtue that was real important to the founders, this idea that if you're gonna be a Republic, and the people are going to choose the government and be the government. We're going to self-government. You need certain qualities in the people to make the country work because uh, you, they're not subjects. They are the government themselves. If the people are the government, the people need certain traits of character for the government to succeed. And that was very important to the founders. So those ideas came and combined to be create this idea of conservative. And then liberalism was built out of populism, what had been the traditional William Jennings Bryan Democratic people versus the powerful type of idea. And then progressivism, which had been a Teddy Roosevelt Republican idea that had been pulled over into the Democratic Party, this idea that we could use policy and planning to create a to create progress, to create a better society. And they combine that into this idea of liberalism that we use policy and planning by experts to benefit populism, the people and the people who are marginalized and the least well off. So these are these ideas. So you unpack them and you see, well, those ideas don't attract people who agree on stuff anymore. One of the big problems is now populist and progressives are supposed to, are, on paper, they're supposed to be in the same party, but a lot of the populists, what they want and what the progressives want in this new era with new problems are opposed. 
they're positioned very differently than they were in the 30s. So they divide. And then liberty and virtue has been kind of at odds for a while sometimes too, because they both have always agreed on what they didn't want, which was the New Deal, but they had different ideas about, okay, now that we have power, what is it that we're going to do? Because the Republican Party was always built as an opposition coalition. It was a coalition that was united to stop New Deal liberalism. It wasn't a coalition that had ever made an agreement about, okay, and then what do we win? What are we going to do? So they have different ideas, and it's always been hard when Republicans win, of uh, you know, or within conservatism about, okay, well, when we have power, what are we supposed to do? So that breaks off. And you see populists have been moving in to be attracted um, to, uh, uh, to uh, the virtue people. So virtue and populism making some kind of new alliance, and then it pushes the liberty people over with the progressives maybe, and that's where it gets complicated because I don't know if woke progressivism and classic progressivism is a new idea or just a twist on an old idea. But regardless, what you end up with is two parties that are in practice divided around social class. Yeah, um, class envy. What? I, I start thinking envy, about it. Yeah. Like two, it would be we would end up with class envy and yeah. it would be terrible. So it's like, what do we do about the post-industrial economy? You get one party that says, well, you know, this new global economy, information economy is bad and it needs to stop, which it can't stop. It, mm -hmm. it can't, you know, a lot of people when we had the industrial revolution wanted that to stop too. And let's go back to the family farmers, but right. you can't. Like once, once trains exist, there's really nothing you can do about it. Yeah. And in the same way, in, in the other side, people who benefit from this world who say, hey, this is great. And then they're just going to go to war with each other over spoils. And that's going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. It's not a fight about, this is the big thing. You want, want the fight to always be about how do we make a miracle work for everybody? Um, my camera go out? It, did, yes, it did. Oh, sorry, yeah, did I just lose now. my camera there? You're back now. Okay, good. Uh, I, I just saw it black out. So I said, yeah, whatever you do, you want to make sure that you have uh, an America that work. Both parties should have disagreements about how to make America work for everybody. So if you look at like liberalism and conservatism, they had different ideas, but they both agreed they both believed that their ideas would make America better for everybody. It wasn't just, well, if conservatives win, then that'll be good for us and forget you guys. It was, our ideas are going to make America better for all Americans. And the liberals believe the same thing. But if we start having a debate that's about how do we seize power so it benefits us and stick it to those guys, that's terrible. Yeah, we don't, we don't want that. So what I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about possibilities and... I, I, the William Jennings Bryan thing kind of catches my imagination. And so I was just thinking of one kind of far out possibility was okay. just, uh, Justin Amash was looking at uh, yeah. uh, running under the libertarian banner and decided mm -hmm. not to. So I was thinking of, and I don't even know all of his policy um, uh -huh. uh, stands or anything, but if someone was to come along like him, who's sort of stood outside of the parties a little bit and, and comes in with like a, a plan that like something mm -hmm. we've never seen before and, and, and says, but I'm going to pass this by the Republicans because they're, they're closer to where I'm at and maybe I can pull them in and kind of hijack that party with a whole bunch of new ideas, then something like that maybe could be what happens mm -hmm. is we get a realignment from, or it could happen on the other side. So someone comes into the party with like, I'm sick of all this. I've got some fabulous ideas. I've been brainstorming this and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I've been talking to Elon Musk or, you know, I've been, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Someone that can come along on one to one party or the other with like a boatload of just fabulous ideas and say, this is what we mm -hmm. need to do. And maybe a brilliant speech at some point. Um, I, and Reagan, remember his Reagan speech um, was a time for choosing. Is that what it was called? Oh, yeah, which, yeah. which created his, yeah, right, for his speech for the Goldwater campaign that created him as a political figure. So maybe something like that? I, I think it's very possible. Like, you know, right, so there's two ways this goes, right? I mean, it's the party replacement or party, it, it's going to happen either way, right? It, one of two things are going to happen because it, the, the, the current situation is unsustainable. So the bad way it happens is like the Whigs, where nobody does anything, nobody comes along. And we just keep punting until things get so bad, one of the parties gets so angry at each other, internally it collapses, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
and that's a nightmare because uh, then you have to do it in, in the middle of chaos and, and every idiot with a bad idea rushes into the vacuum to before stability restores. All right, so that would be bad. The better way that this happens and the way it happened, we said with Brian or even with FDR is that idea that somebody comes along and just says, I'm gonna throw out the old playbook and start from scratch. I have a whole new set of ideas and I'm gonna run on this party and, what, and then the party resorts because when that person wins, people who don't like what they have to say leave and people who do like it from the other party move and then you get a, what is effectively a new party under the old brand name and i was kind of expecting somebody to try it in the democratic primary this year i was watching the democratic prim primary like intently because the opportunity is so obviously there for somebody to come along and say you know what I forget liberalism and conservatism we, I have a whole new idea and a whole new ideology that I'm going to apply that, and look at how I'm going to make everybody's lives better. And I think it might, I think it could work. I think it, if it didn't work now, it could work in four years. They could be the start of something. And I was expecting out of all those candidates, somebody to try it. And the guy who got closest was Pete. I was watching him because he's, I, when you think with Brian, the fact that he was in his 30s and everyone was like, well, he can't win. I was like, well, Brian was 36. I, you know, I thought Pete might be the guy to try it, but he didn't. Yeah. He wanted to stay in the old Democratic coalition, right? Nobody tried it. And, and I think it could happen in the Republican Party. I thought when, it, when a, a, a Justin Amash did what he did, I, I was interested to see what he was going to try to pull off. Mm -hmm. And then he dropped out, like, you know, a couple weeks or even a week later, because the, the interesting thing with him was, would he try to build something that could get to half, right? So the challenge in doing this is you can't, you can't do it on a small agenda that only appeals to 20% of the country, right? You have to still, you gotta win. You gotta get to 50%. So you gotta pull people into your coalition and you have to take your ideas and merge them with other ideas that could build a new ideology, a new idea. And I thought he had promise of doing it. And I was, I was sort of, you know, I know a lot of people you know, gave him a hard time about trying to challenge the system. And everyone says, well, you can't win. Third parties can't win. You're just a spoiler. And I was going to be curious to see him give it a try. I think the opportunity is definitely there. And I don't, it doesn't seem like anyone's trying it this year. And I do think that in the next election, in next cycle, four years, either somebody's going to come along and do that or, or we got the wigs, which would be bad. <laughs> Well, I know what I'm praying for. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, I, I mean, I'm really ex like you say. I'm sometimes I get down and sometimes I get frustrated, <clears throat> but overall, I really am positive. I do think we're going to get there. I, I do think that person's coming. I really do because I just think it's always happened before. I think I believe in America. I believe we're we're waking up to the problems. I just really do think that person who can do that is there. And the opportunities there, it's just getting that person or that movement. And it's got to be bottom up because, you know, here's the thing with these third parties. You can't do, this is the Howard Schultz uh, or a, a Bloomberg idea. It doesn't work top down. You can't just be, a, or even Ross Perot, you can't just be a rich guy and say, I'm going to spend a lot of money and I'm going to be president. Because you don't, to, to, to win the White House, you got to also, you got to have be a party, you got to have senators and congressmen and you got to have roots into the community and people got to have something to believe in and believe in you and they got to believe in you not because they believe you as a person but what you stand for your ideas it's all at the end of the day all of politics is about ideas and values mm -hmm. so you've got to build a new ideology and uh, so you can't do it just some rich guy says i'm going to spend a billion dollars and, and buy the white house yeah. and then i'm going to remake everything but I mean, then there is the FDR example, which is you could have somebody squeak in on the old and then do it stealth once they win, because that is what FDR did too, right? Mm -hmm. FDR ran on the old democratic agenda, but he could get away with it because in the depression, Hoover was now so unpopular. I mean, anybody could have beaten Hoover, mm -hmm. right? The depression was so horrible and people were so disgusted with the government for not fixing it after three years that whoever the Democrats nominated was going to win. So, but, and then when he won, you know, he, when he ran, he wasn't clear. I don't think he even knew what he was going to do. And then he reinvented the Democratic Party. So you could have somebody 
try to win the old way and then come in and throw it out. But anyway, oh, I, I'm, I'm looking for it. I think we're going to get there. I do think that person's coming. I do. Awesome. Well, we're not living in boring times. <laughs> no, we are not. <laughs> Never bored. Sure. Never bored. And now I've got something else to be watching for to see. And now since I've read this book and we've had this discussion, I'm going to be watching every time someone new comes along. Is this it? Is this the person? Is, are they going to have the ideas? You're going to watch it like me because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. If, it, if and when it happens, you need to come back on and we need to talk about I'd it. Love to. Awesome. I'd love to. Well, I appreciate you so much. And again, this is the book, The Next Realignment. I always forget the last part. Why America's Parties Are Crumbling and What Happens Next by Frank Stefano. Correct. Got it right. All right. And um, yeah, go get it. We have a lot of time to read right now, people. So <laughs> it's a fascinating book that if you like history, if you like politics, if you just love Americana, you're going to love this book. It's wonderful. So thank, thank you. you so much. And um, yeah, let's keep in touch. I'll have you back again and we'll follow this whole situation. And listeners, thank you for listening and watching. Um, go check me out on AnnetteTalks.com, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera. Weigh in, let me know what you think. I would be really curious to see what some of my listeners and viewers think um, about this whole idea. And if you have any people or um, groups that you think will step forward. So thank you for listening to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness.